I have a PowerPoint presentation, Amen. and I uh, put together a book and a DVD, Who is the King in America? And I'm just going to jump into my presentation. So uh, writing was invented around three or 4,000 B.C. What was my reason for do, doing this? I wanted to see how unique America was in world history. And I thought, well, you know, let's just zoom out and look at all of it. And so I went back to the beginning of the invention of writing. It's Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets in the Mesopotamian Valley. Today, that's Iraq. Take a stick, poke it in clay. That's the beginning of writing. Here's Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist, Cosmos TV series. He says it was here around 5,000 years ago between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that we learned how to write. And then Egyptian hieroglyphics were invented around 3000 BC, and Chinese characters were invented around 2600 BC, the yellow emperor on bamboo annal books. India's earliest civilizations have writing around 2600, but if you round it out, three or 4,000 years BC, and we are around 2000 years AD, that's around five or 6,000 years of recorded history. Human beings writing down human records. Franklin Roosevelt said, 5,000 years of recorded history have proven that mankind has always believed in God in spite of the many abortive attempts to exile God. He mentions the number of 5,000. Richard Overy wrote the Times Complete History of the World. He said, no date appears before the start of human civilizations around 5,500 years ago in the beginning of a written or pictorial history. And so 6,000 years of human beings writing down human records, it's not that long. 6,000 years is just 60 people living 100 years each back to back. 60 times 100 equals 6,000, right? So we've all met someone who's lived 100 years or close to it, maybe a, a grandmother. How many have met somebody who's lived close to 100 years? We're talking 60 grandmothers, and you're all the way back to the beginning of recorded human history. 60 people living 100 years each back to back. So it's really not that long ago. But now that we have 6,000 years of records, let's look at them. What do they show? They show there's been a 6,000-year quest to rule the world. And the first story that's in the records is uh, Nimrod Tower of Babel. The Jewish commentator Josephus said Nimrod wanted to build the tower so high that if God destroyed the world again with a flood, he could survive on top. So the tower sort of had a defiant, in-your-face attitude toward God. God comes down, confuses the languages, and the people what? Scatter. And so we see this first illustration of power concentrated, defiant against God, and power separated into the hands of the people. So a little illustration, everyone hold up a fist in one hand, say concentrated power, concentrated power. Fingers apart with the other hand, say separated power, separated power. Then back to the fist, concentrated power, concentrated. That is world history. For most of world history, power is in the hands of the kings, pharaohs, Caesars, Kaisers, sultans, and czars. Every now and then, people get a chance to stretch the rubber band and rule themselves without a king. But in times of crises, the rubber band snaps back. That's the premise of my talk, but I'm going to get into it. So, God confuses the languages that people scatter, but it's almost like every generation since has tried to rebuild the Tower of Babel. Only on a bigger scale, because with military technology, you can kill more people, right? Iron stronger than bronze and phalanx and gunpowder and scimitar swords and so forth. Have you ever seen the movie The Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger? There's this killer metal robot from the future, and they blow it up into little metal pieces, and everybody sighs relief. Then the little pieces melt into little silvery droplets, and they roll together into a silvery pool, and out of it comes the hand of this Terminator machine and starts chasing them again. He's like, how do you get rid of this thing? How do you get rid of this Tower of Babel? Every generation wants to re rebuild it. And uh, anyway, now in geometry, there's something called the golden ratio, and it's observable in nature. Have you ever seen a Nautilus seashell? Does a little circle, comes around a little bigger circle, comes around a bigger, bigger circle. Uh, that's a ratio of geometric expansion. It's observable in a tornado spinning or a hurricane or a galaxy. And um, I thought, well, would it be interesting to see if we plot out all the empires in world history and see if it follows the same pattern? And lo and behold, it sort of does. So you have the Nimrod Tower of Babel, and then around 2500 BC, you have Gilgamesh, king of Uruk or Iraq. And he is the first one to build a wall around the city. That was his new invention. And um, then he goes on this old journey to meet this guy who survived a global flood. That's right. The oldest story ever written in any language is the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in the ancient Akkadian language. And um, he meets this old guy who had built a boat, covered it with tar and pitch, filled it full of animals, and when the flood receded, it repopulated the world. It's the story of Noah. 
Did you know over a hundred ancient civilizations have flood stories and flood legends in their ancient past? Gee, maybe there was a flood. And, um, and so then around 2250 BC, you have Sargon of Acadia, conquers a bunch of walled cities from the Persian, from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean. And then you have 2,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs. And they own the people, the cattle, the land. 5,000 years of Chinese emperors. And then uh, you have Assyria. Nineveh is the capital. And they have the largest empire the planet Earth had seen to this time. And, of course, they have a king, Sennacherib, that, you know, takes the ten northern tribes of Israel captive and Tilgath, Palaser, all those. And uh, Assyria is conquered by Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar. And it's conquered by Cyrus of Persia, Darius, right? And he's the one who lets the Jews go back to rebuild their temple. But he had the largest empire, Cyrus of Persia. And then uh, Alexander the Great, his empire conquers the Persians. And he has the largest empire that the planet had ever seen to that time. He stopped from going into India, uh, and the Indians have the Gupta Empire, Chandra Gupta, quarter of the world's population underneath of this guy's control. And then you have around 25 BC, Augustus Caesar, and he has the biggest empire that planet Earth had ever seen to this point. And lo and behold, he wanted to track everybody, like a NSA, Patriot Act, Homeland Security, G, right? You know, Dragonfly, Google thing, or whatever. And so he calls it a global census. Everybody has to go back to their hometown. Why? So they can be tracked, be registered. But God's plan is behind the plan because that had Mary and Joseph go there to be registered, and Jesus was born in Bethlehem, fulfilling prophecy. Um, but then in the 400 AD, you have Attila the Hun. He has an army of a half a million people. The Christians thought he was the Antichrist. I mean, he's wiping out cities across Europe, and he has the largest empire that the planet had seen. He stopped from going into the Byzantine Empire by Justinian. He's got this huge empire. And then in the 700s, you have Islam. Conquers from the Persian Gulf to the Atlantic Ocean. And they have the largest empire. They're stopped from going into France by Charles Martel. His grandson is Charlemagne. In 800 AD, he's crowned Holy Roman Emperor. He's got the largest empire. And then 1200s, Genghis Khan has the largest. He conquers from Korea to Hungary, kills 30 million people. He's got the largest empire. His grandson is Kublai Khan in China. And then Tamerlane in the 1300s kills another 17 million across Central Asia. Ivan the Terrible of Russia and the 1400s. 12 time zones in Russia. It's enormous. And he kills 60,000. And then you cross the ocean to the Americas. And you got Montezuma. And he's controlling the Aztec Empire. And then you got Atahualpa and Incan Peru. And everybody's an employee of the government. And he's controlling everybody. And then you have the King of Spain, Charles V. He's got the largest empire. And then in the 1700s, you know, the King of France, Louis XIV, the Sun King of France. And then finally in the 18th and 19th century, you have the king of England, has the largest empire that planet Earth had ever seen. He was like a globalist. I mean, he controls all of India, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, British Guyana, Canada, and America. So we see this trend of power wanting to concentrate on this ever-increasing scale. But the problem is, it goes all the way back to the fall in the garden and selfishness coming into the human DNA, and Cain killing Abel, and one king taking a kingdom from another king, and it just keeps getting bigger because of military technology, but it's that same fallen nature. And St. Augustine called it libido dominandi, the lust to dominate. And, uh, and you can see, sort of like it's fractal, you take this little thing, then it magnified bigger and bigger, you've got this Cain killing Abel, Nimrod Tower of Babel, and then you got what? The Antichrist, right? And it's eventually the seed, Jesus said, the wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. This tear of the seed of the sin of Adam is going to finally have its ultimate fruition in the Antichrist. But the righteous seed, right, of Abel and so forth, and trusting in the lamb is going to, and of course, uh, we win. Uh, because of Jesus. We were to sing praises to Jesus because he crushes the serpent, right? So uh, we're going to see this play out, but it's, we have this desire to know where do we fit in in this plan? Uh, so uh, the movie, The Lord of the Rings, there's a line where Gandalf tells Frodo, always remember Frodo, the ring is trying to get back to its master. It wants to be found. Power actually wants to concentrate. And it's the subconscious, the pull of magnet, law of gravity. And since it's in the human DNA, you put some babies in a playpen, one of them takes the rattle from the others. You put some kids on a playground, one of them is the bully hogging the ball. You put some junior high girls in a clique, and one of them is the diva. Right? <laughs> you put some natives in the woods, one of them is the Indian chief, and you put some people in an inner city, one of them is a gang leader. And all a king is, is a glorified gang leader. It's a hierarchical system. 
If you are friends with the king, you are more equal. If you are not friends with the king, you are less equal. And if you are an enemy of the king, you're dead. It's called treason. Or you're a slave. And so it's this pyramid structure to society that keeps repeating itself all around the globe on this ever-increasing scale, ultimately with the global thing. And um, the problem is it's in our own DNA. You think, really? Let's say you get to be the king. Pretty nice. And then you have a sister that you really love, and she has a teenage son who starts drinking and partying and hanging around with the wrong kids, and he's driving, and he hits someone with a car and kills them. And now this teenager is facing mandatory prison time, manslaughter charges, and your sister comes begging to you and says, you're not going to let my little Johnny get locked away half his life, are you? It wasn't his fault. Those other kids talked him into it, blah, blah, blah. What are you going to say to your sister? Well, I'll let little Johnny off the hook this time, but don't let it happen again. Guess what? As soon as you say that, you are the corrupt dictator. <laughs> you just sent ripples through your kingdom that if your family or friends with the king, you get special treatment. If you're not family and friends, you don't get it. And if you got somebody wanting to point out your favoritism and corruption, you're going to be tempted to want to shut him up. It just happens. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And favoritism is corruption. Now, in reading through all these ancient civilizations, I saw three things that kept repeating themselves. One is people transitioned from hunter-gatherers to agriculture. And we know the Bible story, Adam and Eve plucked the fruit off the tree, gathering, and then we have Cain was a tiller of the soil. And so as groups transitioned from hunter-gatherer to agriculture, they needed to know when to plant the crops. So they needed to keep track of the seasons, which means they had to keep track of the stars. And so they would build big immovable structures to observe the stars, Stonehenge, ziggurats, pyramids. And then somebody got to climb up the building, look at the stars, and come down with this secret knowledge as to know when to plant the barley, <laughs> right? And this developed into this person claiming that they were an intermediary between the heavens and the people. And it started to came, I got this secret knowledge from heaven. And, I'm, and lo and behold, it turned into these kings claiming to be divinely appointed. You had the Babylonian Assyrian kings were king priests. The Egyptian pharaohs claimed to be the son of the god Osiris. The Roman emperors claimed to be divine and demanded their image be worshipped. The uh, Chinese emperors claimed to be, have a mandate from heaven to rule. Uh, the Incan emperors claimed to be delegates of the sun god. The Muslim caliphs claimed to be successors of the messenger of Allah. The Indian rajas uh, was a semi-divine cast of rulers. The uh, Japanese emperors were heavenly sovereigns, and then they Christianized it in Europe and called it the divine right of kings. God chose me to be the king, so whatever my will is must be God's will because he put me here so I can pretty well do anything I want. You challenge me, you're challenging God, and I can kill you. And so these kings didn't believe that all men were created equal. They believed they were created extra special. And, um, and so the pattern was that the creator gives all the power to this one person, the king, and he dispenses it to the people. And so all these kingdoms have kings. So here's King Louis XIV, the sun king of France. He's called the sun king because his subjects revolved around him like, like planets every day. Sorry. And um, he said, I am the state. Talk about an ego. And then his administrators said, King, I'm sorry you can't do this particular thing because it's illegal. He says, it is legal because I wish it. Oh, well, that's easy. The law is nothing more than the king's wishes. And he just happens to have a really powerful army to make you obey. And so King James of England, Jamestown named after him, he says, kings are God's lieutenants upon earth, sit upon God's throne. The king is the overlord of the whole land, master over every person, having power over the life and death of everyone. And so you go through these 6,000 years, you see these kingdoms keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger until finally the king of England had the biggest and America's founders decided they wanted to break away from this globalist king. I mean, 13 million square miles, a half a billion people, all of India, a quarter of the world's population right there, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, British Guyana, Canada, and America. He was a globalist. And so America's founders decided they wanted to flip it and, and make the people the king. So it took centuries, millennium, for us to have a chance to not have a king. And uh, so uh, let's go through a little of this history. 
Um, James Wilson was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He says, after a period of 6,000 years since creation, the United States exhibit to the world the first instance of a nation assembling voluntarily and deciding that system of government under which they should live. So he uses the number 6,000, and something unique happened in America. Here is Daniel Webster. He says, miracles do not cluster. What has happened once in 6,000 years may not happen again. Hold on to the Constitution, for if the American Constitution should fail, there will be anarchy throughout the world. Why? All the Constitution is, is taking the power of a king, separating it into three branches, separating it federal to state level, tying up this federal Frankenstein with ten handcuffs. It's taking this Tower of Babel and power and separating it. And people say, oh, if they don't have the Constitution anymore, what's going to happen? Power is going to reconcentrate. And um, so we go through the history. The King of England's the biggest, and we're going to talk about how the pilgrims broke away. The king passed the act of uniformity. Everybody had to believe exactly the way he tells them to believe. And if you had five people meeting in your home, you're talking religion without approval of the king, they will bust into your house and arrest everyone. If you're caught preaching within five miles of a town without approval of the king, you get arrested and dragged before the star chamber. It was a room where they had stars on the ceiling, and, um, and they would cut your nose in half and cut your ear off and brand you on the face as a heretic with the letters SL for seditious libel. And Anyway, the, the kings would burn people at the stake like William Tyndall for not believing the way the king did. So these pilgrims flee Holland, uh, the Puritans tried to purify the king. I'll get to them. But the pilgrims were separatists, and they fled England and fled to Holland. And they're there for 12 years, and Spain threatens to attack Holland, which they do. It's an 80-year war of independence. And when that happens, the pilgrims decide to flee again. And this time they decide to go far away, 3,000 miles to Jamestown. It's a king-run colony, but they figure we're so far away, we can sort of do what we want, and the king won't notice us. So they leave Holland, they go to England, they get on a boat, the Mayflower, to tell the whole story. 102 of them crammed in a four-foot high space for 66 days for a 3,000-mile journey. It's stormy, it's tossing back and forth, one dies, a baby's born, I mean, and they finally um, have one guy was actually washed overboard in the freezing Atlantic, and they tow him back in. And they finally get to the shore of America and they find out they're, they're 500 miles off course. And they go, oh, no problem, just sail down the coast. No, it's winter time. It's dangerous, stormy. And off the coast of Cape Cod is what's called the graveyard of ships. You ever been to a beach and you walk out, a, you know, 100 yards and it's only up to your knees? Cape Cod, you can be a mile out. You think, you're oh, I'm really far away. And you run on a sandbar. And if it's stormy, the waves will beat your ship and it'll splinter to pieces. 3,000 ships have sunk off the coast of Cape Cod. The pilgrims almost sink. The captain barely gets out. They go back to Plymouth Rock and he says, everybody off the boat. No more sailing. And the pilgrims like, have a question. Uh, who's going to be in charge of us? The whole world is ruled by kings. Kings have their colonies. Uh, there's no king appointed person on our boat. Who is going to be in charge of us? They do something unique. They give themselves the authority to start a government. It's called the Mayflower Compact. And it starts off, we, in ye presence of God, covenant ourselves together into a civil body politic to enact just and equal laws, as shall be thought most meet or necessary, unto which we promise all due submission. Simple, revolutionary. It was a polarity change in world government from top down to bottom up. In the womb of this little Mayflower, hidden away in there, is this DNA change. Instead of it being run by a king from the top down, it's we the people. It's us. It's a bottom-up form of government. It's the difference between a dead pyramid and a living tree, where every root and every little capillary root sucks in nutrients to help keep this thing alive. Every citizen needs to participate to make this thing work. It is a bottom-up form of government. So it's no longer divine right of kings. It's we the people. Now, where did the pilgrims get this idea that they could rule themselves without a king? From the guy there on the right kneeling, there's Elder William Brewster with an open Bible. The guy on the right is Pastor John Robinson. He is their pilgrim pastor. And this is him sending them off when they left Holland. And he was not an Anglican king-appointed pastor. He was a separatist pastor. He's considered one of the founders of the Congregationalist Church. And it's only half percent Congregationalist today, but back then it had this influence uh, on the government development. Why? Well, it's this church model where this is a home group. I mean, it's just 102 of them. Everybody in the little group fasts and prays and votes. They simply took their congregational form of church model and they made it their government model. 
everybody on the Mayflower, what do we do? Well, it's all fast and pray and vote. And so this began to spread, by the way, that painting hangs in our U.S. Capitol. It spread across New England. So let's look at the history. 1620, the pilgrims come over, and they're there for 10 years. And uh, 1630, it heats up for those Puritans back in England, getting their noses cut in half or whatever. And so they said, if this small group, a couple hundred pilgrims, can survive in the New World, so can we. So from 1630 to 1640, 16,000 Puritans come across. It's called the Great Puritan Migration. They're flooding into Massachusetts. But once they get here, they have a little change of heart. In England, they did not like the king telling them how to have church. But once they get to America, they go, you know what? There's so many of us, we sort of are the government. Maybe it's not such a bad thing that the government tell the church how to have church because we're in charge. And so they began to institute Puritan religious uniformity. And so the dissenting pastors that fled from England uh, there, if you didn't agree with the Puritans, you had to flee again. Justice William Black wrote in the case Engel versus Vitale, when some of the very groups which had most strenuously opposed the established church of England found themselves sufficiently in control of colonial governments, they passed laws making their own religion, the official religion of their respective colonies. And so the nonconforming dissenting pastors had to flee again. And you had a Reverend John Lothrop and his church fled and founded Barnstable, Massachusetts. A Reverend Roger Williams and his church fled and founded Providence, Rhode Island and the First Baptist Church in America. A Reverend John Wheelwright and his church fled and founded Exeter, New Hampshire. And a Reverend Thomas Hooker and his church fled and founded Hartford, Connecticut. Now, this is 50 years before Europe's Age of Enlightenment. These are pastors and their churches fleeing Puritan uniformity and starting communities, right? And so you got Reverend Thomas Hooker. He flees, he founds Hartford, and his church members come to him. And they say, Pastor, how do we do the government thing? And he gives an address in 1638 titled, The Foundation of Authority is Laid in the, Firstly in the Free Consent of the People. This was revolutionary because in Europe, the foundation of authority was the creator given the power to the king and him dispensing it to the people. And so this is a bottom-up form of government. This influenced our declaration, government from the consent of the government. Gov governed. In his speech, he goes on, the privilege of election belongs to the people. This influenced our U.S. Constitution. We, the people. He goes on in his talk, they who have the power to appoint officers and magistrates, it is in their power also to set the bounds and limitations of the power. His sermon was written down, and it's called the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. It was the Constitution of Connecticut from 1639 up until 1818. Connecticut used Pastor Thomas Hooker's sermon as their constitution. It's considered the first written constitution in history. That's why Connecticut's called the Constitution State. And we have a plaque in England. It says, Thomas Hooker, founder of the state of Connecticut, father of American democracy. Did you know that? This pastor you never heard of over in England, they think he's the father of American democracy. Here's another plaque in England. Thomas Hooker, Puritan clergyman, reputed father of American democracy. Here's a statue of Thomas Hooker on the Capitol grounds in Hartford, Connecticut, holding a Bible. It says, leading his people through the wilderness, he founded Hartford. On this site, he preached the sermon which inspired the fundamental orders. It was the first written constitution that created a government. Here's another plaque in Hartford. It says, Thomas Hooker's preached his famous sermon, the foundation of authority is laid firstly in the free consent of the people. And then the representatives of the people passed the fundamental orders. What do the fundamental orders say? The people conjoin ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth. This sounds like the Mayflower. We covenant ourselves together to form a civil body politic. Why? To preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Here's another plaque in Hartford. It says, Thomas Hooker's congregation established the form of government upon which the present Constitution of the United States is modeled. Do you catch the significance of this? So, oh, I thought it was all the Age of Enlightenment stuff. This is 50 years before that. These are separatist pastors fleeing Puritan uniformity, and they're setting up forms of government, congregational models, and this becomes the blueprint for our U.S. Constitution. Reverend Roger Williams, Baptist, founded Rhode Island. The government in this island is a popular government. That is to say, it is power in the body of free men orderly assembled. So in New England, instead of separation of church and state, it's the pastors and their churches that created the state. How could you say pastor don't get involved in politics when it's the pastor's sermon that's their constitution? How could you say church members don't get involved in politics when all there was in Hartford was the church members? 
Now, these pastors in New England realized that the kingdom of God could never be forced from the top down. They fled from Europe where kings were burning people at the stake for not believing the way they did. And they saw in scriptures that Jesus never forced anybody to follow him. One time he, you know, um, uh, said something difficult. Many disciples walked with him no more. And he he turns to to Peter and says, you want to go too? There's the door. Jesus didn't force it. He didn't run after him with a sword saying, get back here or I'll chop your head off. No, he was willing to let him go. If Jesus never forced anyone to follow him, we can't force anybody to follow him. And so if the kingdom of God can never be forced from the top down, how's it going to happen? Well, these New England pastors thought, if it's not going to be from the top down, if the majority of the people hold godly values and they elect representatives with their godly values, then laws would be passed reflecting those godly values, and the values of the kingdom could come voluntarily from the bottom up, not forcibly from the top down. Do you see the change? The flip. Instead of the European model, the creator to the king to the people, it's the creator to the people, and then we choose our own leaders. See how we conveniently leave out the king? In other words, God is a jealous God. He wants a personal relationship with each person. He doesn't want some government, some king, in between you and him. He wants you personally to be able to get your rights from him and you're accountable to him. And so uh, Calvin Coolidge says, placing every man on a plane where he acknowledged no superiors, he must inevitably choose his own rulers through a system of self-government. So we're all equal, but who's going to fix the potholes in the road? Well, we got to vote for somebody. And so the Puritans had this model that came from ancient Israel called the covenant. People in agreement with each other, you get your rights from God, you're accountable to God. In the next century, it turned into a social contract with or without God. In the next century, it turned into Marxism and the French Revolution. And it was a social contract specifically without God, which means you get your rights from the state and you're accountable to the state, which makes the state God. Anyway, so, but the pilgrims had the idea of the Puritans of this covenant. Calvin Coolidge says, am I talking too fast? Is this making sense? Did I lose anybody? You want me to repeat anything? And um, anyway, Calvin Coolidge says the principles which went into the Declaration of Independence are found in the sermons of the early colonial clergy. They preached equality because they believed in the fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man, in order that they might have freedom to express these thoughts and opportunities to put them into action. Whole congregations with their pastors migrated to the colonies. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Where did the pastors get their idea that they could rule themselves without a king? Well, they studied a little bit of the English Magna Carta and a little of the Roman Republic, a little of Athenian democracy, but ultimately ancient Israel. Think ancient Israel? I found this in my research. Did you know the U.S. Constitution was written, but it needed to be ratified by nine states? They had eight, and New Hampshire was in line to be the ninth, but it was having a deadlock. So they paused and have a day of fasting, yes, and then Harvard President Samuel Langdon gives them an address in New Hampshire. The address is titled, The Republic of the Israelites, an Example to the American States. He goes on, instead of the 12 tribes of Israel, we may substitute the 13 states of the American Union and see this application plainly. After his address, New Hampshire delegates vote, they ratify it, they're the ninth state to do so, and our Constitution goes into effect. Our U.S. Constitution went into effect after the sermon the Republic of the Israelites, an example to the American states. Our founders look back to ancient Israel. Well, what was the Republic of the Israelites? That was the first 400 years out of Egypt before they got King Saul. And so they come out of Egypt, and for 400 years there's no king. This is the beginning of the concept of equality, that everyone you see is equal to you. There's no royal family somewhere that everybody's trying to butter up next to. Right? And so ancient Israel was the beginning of the concept of equality. Israel had this idea of tolerance. Here they were worshiping the one true God, and they never felt compelled to force anybody to worship the one true God. Um, And Israel was the first nation with private land ownership. You see, wherever there's a king, you never really own the land. It's always conditional of you staying on the nice side of the king. You cross the king, he will take away the land and kill you. In Israel, the land was permanently titled to each family. If they got in a pinch and sold it, every 50 years, the land reverted back to that family. This prevented a dictator from gathering up all the land and putting the people back into slavery. And now, if you own land, you can accumulate stuff. The Bible called that being blessed. Karl Marx called it being a capitalist. 
You got stuff, you worked hard and saved it, right? So it's the promised land because the people actually got to own the land. Israel was the first nation with no police. Everyone was taught the law. Everyone helped enforce the law. It was like everybody was deputized. We have a little of that today with traffic laws. Somebody's weaving in and out of the lanes, and you'll take it upon yourself to honk the horn. Or maybe a mom watching a bunch of neighborhood kids. She has no problem correcting somebody else's kid. In Israel, everybody corrected everybody else. Self-pleasing system. Israel had no standing army. You have a king. He has an army to enforce his will. In Israel, every man was in the militia and armed with a sword upon their thigh, and they were ready at a moment's notice to defend their family and their community. Israel had no prisons. Remember in Egypt, Joseph was in prison for several years? In Israel, when a crime was committed, you got the accused and the elders of the city to the gates, and you had the trial immediately. And of course, there was a city of refuge you could run away to to await a trial. Israel had a bureaucracy-free welfare system. So in Egypt, people were selling their souls to the Pharaoh for a bag of grain. In Israel, when someone harvested their field, they left the gleanings, the corners of the field, for the poor people to pick through, like Ruth. This way, the poor were taken care of and kept their dignity because they did a little something without some political leader collecting everything and doling it back out to those who can help him stay in power. Israel had a system of honesty. God hates unjust weights and measures. Became a basis for commerce. You could trust people. And Israel got to choose their own leaders. So Moses spake unto the children of Israel, How can I myself bear alone your burden? Take you wise men and understanding and known among your tribes, and I'll make them rulers over you. This was an election process within the tribe. You know the people that hate covetousness. You, and so anyone in Israel could be raised up into leadership. Here's Gideon from a nobody family. Here's Deborah. A woman becomes a national leader, not because she's related to royalty. She just knows the law. She's honest. The reputation spreads. She sits under a tree. People make their way all the way across the country for her to hear their case. Where else in the world could a woman become a national leader who's not related to a king? It's just her. So Harvard President Samuel Langdon continues, the Israelites may be considered as a pattern to the world in all ages of government on Republican principles. From abject slavery, a mere mob, to a well-regulated nation under laws far superior to what any other nation could boast. Think of it. They go from 400 years of slavery, they can't even read. And suddenly they get downloaded, this most unique form of government that the planet had ever seen. And then Israel was the first nation that could read. So Sumeria, we talked about them. They had 1,500 cuneiform characters. Not only was it complicated, it was only for kings and scribes. Um, Egypt had 3,000 hieroglyphic characters. Only 1% of Egypt could read. Reading and writing was the scribes' secret knowledge. They kept the hieroglyphs complicated on purpose as job security. And China, they were needed to interpret those things. China had 10,000 characters, but it was just for court records. And only the upper class could read. It was the communication of the deep state amongst themselves, and the common people were kept illiterate and ignorant. Matter of fact, we had a little of that in America prior to the Civil War. Some southern states had laws making it a crime to teach slaves to read. Frederick Douglass, the Republican advisor to Lincoln, writes in his autobiography of being on a plantation, slave master's sister-in-law is teaching him the alphabet. Her husband walks in, yells at her, don't you dare teach slaves to read. They'll grow discontent and run away. Forge their documents. Frederick Douglass says that was the first sermon that convinced me that I wanted to learn how to read. And so if you want to control people, you want to keep them ignorant. And so when Moses comes down the mountain, he does not just have the law. He has the law in 22 characters, not 1,500 or 3,000 or 10,000, 22 characters. So easy to learn. Children could learn how to read. First letter is Aleph, second letter Beth. Sound familiar? Israel is the first instance in world history of a literate populace. So it's a citizen-based model. You have educated and moral citizens that can rule themselves without a king. You see the picture? And so if you think of it as a spectrum of power that we did earlier, so you have a king, he rules through fear. So total government, no government. So total government, king rules through fear. No government would be anarchy unless each person is taught the law. It's like everybody downloads a behavioral app on their iPhone. Instead of a GPS telling you where to turn, it tells you how to act. 
don't be nice, be, don't be mean to that person, don't steal that, right? Don't cheat. Right? And the Levites are the computer geeks that help you to download the app. I need a little help down. So they'll sit, sit you down. Okay, we got to, here's line one, line two, right? But why would you follow it? This is the big question. What would motivate you to follow an internal moral, to deny yourself yielding to a temptation? Israel had the key ingredient. God, a God who is watching everyone, he wants you to be fair, and he's going to hold you accountable in the future. So you're about to steal something. Nobody's around. You know you can get away with it. And then you think, God is watching me. He wants me to be fair. He's going to hold me accountable. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. And it creates something in your head called a conscience. If everybody in the country really, truly believes this, you can maintain complete order with no police. Maximum liberty. Right? Everybody doesn't want to steal because God's watching them. They're going to hold them accountable. And so, now it only works with the God of the Bible. An Islamic Allah God says there's an infidel woman there. Nobody's around. You can rape her. It's okay. The God of the Bible says do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So the system, when we say it's one nation under God, it's more than just a nice little acknowledgement. That's the motivating power that makes the whole thing work. That's the battery that energizes the whole thing. Power of a king, he's, he rules through fear. Take it and separate it into the hands of the people. It's chaos unless each person is taught the law and the Levites help them to download it. Why do you follow the law? This God of the Bible is watching everyone, wants you to be fair and going to hold you accountable. Reagan said this, without God, there's no virtue because there's no prompting of the conscience. He goes on, uh, William Jennings Bryan, 1908, a religion which teaches personal responsibility to God gives strength to morality. There is a powerful restraining influence in the belief that an all-seeing eye scrutinizes every thought and word and act of the individual. But if you get rid of this God, all you got is a bunch of rules. Why follow him? Some will out of habit. Others are going to say, forget this, and they're going to yield to their selfish side. And rob and steal and kill and smash windows and set buildings on fire and have mobs in the street and ambush policemen and kill classmates. And it's going to turn into so much chaos, everybody's going to say, we need the government to come in and restore order. The government will come in, collect everybody's guns, take away all their freedom, and yeah, they'll restore order. But when the dust settles, you will have fundamentally transformed your government from the people ruling themselves from the bottom up back to a king ruling from the top down. And there's a whole bunch of philosophers throughout history, Machiavelli, Hegel, Karl Marx, Saul Linsky, that talk about intentionally creating domestic crises and sending agitators to stir up riots. Why? Because once it gets so lawless and random killing, everybody needs your reaction. We just need the government to come in and restore order. And they do, but they take away all the freedoms in the process. So what happened with ancient Israel? It worked as long as the priest taught it. When the priest stopped teaching the law, it fell apart. Oh, here's Eli, the high priest. The main guy that's supposed to be teaching the law, his own sons are sleeping with women in the very tent where the Ark of the Covenant is. Can you imagine that? And then here's a Levite with a silver graven image in the house of a guy named Micah. You read the story, you're scratching your head. What's this Levite doing with a graven image? Isn't this one of the commandments? It's not supposed to happen. And then a terrible story of a Levite with a concubine. The law says the Levites to marry a virgin of his own tribe. Here he is with a woman not even married to. They're traveling. They're in a house surrounded by sodomites. Something about that behavior that appears at the very last stages of a people ruling themselves, just throwing off the restraints. And they're not content to do it with them. They want to force it on somebody else. And so they're banging on the door. The poor girl gets raped and dies. And by the time you're grossed out by the story, you read this line. Every man did that which was right in their own eyes. Why? Because the priests had stopped teaching him what was right in the Lord's eyes. Oh, you feel like you're a you know, girl today, boy tomorrow, whatever. Whatever you feel like, or whatever's right in your own eyes, that's the last step. And so what happened is total chaos in Israel. And so they all go to Samuel the prophet, and they say, this isn't working anymore. Uh, we want to be like all the other countries. We want a king. And Samuel cries, and the Lord tells him, they did not reject thee. They rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Lo and behold, God's original plan for Israel was to not have a king. Everybody owned private property to be blessed. The priests teach them the law. They're all accountable to God, right? And when they rejected that, they got a king, all right. And it was Saul. And Saul turns around and kills most of the priests, if you remember the story. So here we have these 6,000 years of world history. The power concentrates into the hands of kings, pharaohs, Caesars, guys keep getting bigger and bigger. Israel was an anomaly. And then it's, you know, they were come back. Uh, God can still continued his plan of salvation uh, you know, through King David and everything. But as far as the people of Israel ruling themselves, that, that part of it was over. And so the most powerful king is the king of England. And America's founders decided to break away, take the power of the king, separate it. So who's the king in America? Signer of the Constitution, Governor Morris, said, the magistrate is not the king, the people are the king. Chief Justice John Jay said, the people are the sovereign of this country. 
Signer of the Constitution, James Wilson. Sovereignty resides in the people. They have not parted with it. Abraham Lincoln. The people of these United States are the rightful masters of both Congresses and courts. I love this quote from Grover Cleveland. The sovereignty of 60 millions of free people, sovereignty means the kingship, the sovereignty of 60 millions of free people is the working out of the divine right of man to govern himself, a manifestation of God's plan concerning the human race. So who's the king in America? We are. We, the people, are the king. The word citizen is Greek, and it has the connotation of a co-ruler, a co-sovereign, a, co a co-king. So we're all citizens of America. We're all co-kings of America. Now, imagine visiting a king, maybe in the Old Testament. You're going through the streets of Jerusalem and you're witnessing murder, rape, and crime, terrible stuff. And you finally get into the king's chamber and the king looks up at you and he says, did, did you see all that terrible stuff coming in here? I wish someone would fix it. And you like reach over and tap him on the shoulder and say, excuse me, you're the king. This is your kingdom. I think you're the one accountable to God to fix this mess. That's like somebody in America watching TV, seeing all the terrible stuff going on, saying, I wish somebody would fix this mess. Hello, have a finger reach through the TV tube and tap you on the shoulder. You're the king. You're the one accountable to God to fix this mess. <laughs> and you say, well, oh, I need somebody to tell me what to do. Since when does the king sit on his throne and say, can somebody tell me what I'm supposed to do? Hey, butler, cook, uh, come here. What, what am I supposed to do? No, it's your job to get educated on the issues, seek God's will, and you tell your representatives what needs to happen. You're the king. James Wilson, every citizen forms a part of the sovereign power. He possesses a vote. I love this quote, John Jay. He says, Americans are the first people whom heaven is favored with an opportunity of choosing the forms of government under which they should live. All other constitutions have derived their existence from violence or accidental circumstances. Your lives, your liberty, your property will be at the disposal only of your creator and yourselves. If I were to sum up one quote that shows the greatness of America, right? Make America great, great again. It's this one right here. Your lives, your liberty, your property are at the disposal of your creator and yourselves. There's no king in between you and your creator. There's no government that says, you got to live in this neighborhood. you got to wear this clothes, a burqa or whatever. you gotta, You can't go to that church anymore. You, you have to marry this person and not that person. No, you get to decide. Our founding fathers, for all their human failings, gave us a form of government where you get to decide what you want to do with your life. Now, Reagan put it this way. In this country of ours took place the greatest revolution that has ever taken place in the world's history. Every other revolution simply exchanged one set of rulers for another. Here, for the first time in all the thousands of years of man's relation to man, maybe 6,000, the Founding Fathers established the idea that you and I had within ourselves the God-given right and ability to determine our own destiny. You want to pursue a different career? you got the freedom to do it. Apply yourself. Study hard. You can do it. So in America, you get to be the king of your life. Now, one more step. You have the opportunity of willingly submitting your life to Jesus, the King of Kings. We sang about that this morning. He's our king. He's our king because we voluntarily submit ourselves to him. We kneel down and say, Jesus, you're our king. And so the book of Revelation says, Jesus Christ washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever. So he's made us king. So we're all kings of America. And Jesus is the king of kings, and we get to voluntarily submit ourselves to him. All right? It the, the, says they cast their crowns at his feet. So the, you have a crown, but you cast it at his feet. Now, I thought this was interesting. Psalms, it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. It's not an earthly king ruling through fear from the top down. You do what he says or he kills you. It's a bottom-up form of government where you voluntarily submit yourselves to him because he loves you and you love him. My, thy people shall be willing in the day of his power. Anyway, um, I could go on and on, but I hope you understand that this is what we have in America. And we thank the veterans for fighting to preserve this freedom.
I know I'm a little bit over time, but if, can I take a minute and, and share the gospel in a unique way? Um, so Adam and Eve sinned and they hid from God. Have you ever sinned against anybody? You sort of don't want to be around the person you've sinned against. Let's say you're talking about somebody behind their back, you're joking, making fun, and all of a sudden you look up and there's the very person. <laughs> Question, are you drawn to want to go over to that person? Or like, oh great, I'm just talking about, I think I'm going to sneak out the back. Your own conscience just does not want you to be around the person you've sinned against. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they're the ones, that, it's like two magnets that are stuck together and one of them turns. First one wants to touch, but they, they, uh, second one wants to get away. They hid, why? It's because your conscience, so you know, your conscience does not want you to be around the person you've sinned against. The polarity is the wrong way. So it's not so much that God sends people to hell. It's once people sin against God, their own conscience won't let them come into his presence. Right? If you're doing a good job at work, the boss says, hey, go and see you in my office. Oh, fine. But if you've been cheating and stealing, taking real long lunches and doing stuff you shouldn't, and the boss says, hey, I want to see you in my office. Do you want to go into his office? No, you're like hesitating. And so Adam and Eve says, man, we blew it. Let's hide. We have to do something to make ourselves acceptable to God again. Let's put on fig leaves. That was the beginning of false religions. Man coming up with man's idea how to make man acceptable to God. Did the fig leaves work? No. And this little line, God made Adam and Eve coats of skins. We read it really fast, but if you think on it, how do you make a coat of skin? Kill an animal. Something has to die. You think God went to the other side of the garden, killed an animal, and brought Adam and Eve some nice tailored outfits? Or do you think maybe he killed the animal right in front of them? And they witnessed the first death ever. Right? Creation just happens as the first thing ever to die. And Adam and Eve are watching this innocent animal go through the pangs of dying. And they're thinking to themselves, we're the ones that sinned, but this innocent animal is the one that's dying. And God wanted to make it really clear that the animal was dying in their place, that right in front of them, he strips the skin off the animal and he puts it on their naked bodies. Maybe it still had a little blood on it. They were covered in the blood. And so for the rest of their lives, they are wearing the skin of that animal that they watched die in their place. And whenever God sees Adam and Eve, he sees them clothed with the skin of the animal, the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So Adam and Eve tell Cain and Abel. Cain decides um, he wants to worship God. But he does an offshoot of the church of the fig leaf. He starts the church of the fruits and the nuts, right? Sort of like <laughs> California. <laughs> Cain's is a religion of works. And we know it's works because God told Adam, the ground is cursed for your sake and you'll bring forth fruit by the sweat of your brow. Sweat is work. So here's Cain sweating, planting it, harvesting, getting all, piles all of his works on the altar. Did his works make him acceptable to God? No. And Abel did the lamb thing. And it's this picture, God's on one side, we're on the other side. Our sins separate us from God. We hide from him because the polarity is the wrong way. And the lamb pays for the sin. So Abraham offered lambs. Moses said, every family in Israel kill a lamb, put the blood over the doorpost of its house. The high priest brings the blood of the lamb into the holy holies and sprinkles it on the mercy seat. The blood actually changed it from a judgment seat into a mercy seat. Solomon had a thousand of them killed when he dedicated the temple. Finally, John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, behold, the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So God's on one side, we're on the other side, our sins separate us from God, and the Lamb pays for the sin. So I ask people, are you approaching God as Cain or as Abel? If you are still hoping you're good enough to go to heaven, you are approaching God as Cain. I hope I piled enough stuff on the altar Maybe a couple more handfuls of barley. That'll do it. Or are you approaching God as Abel? It's not me. It's this lamb that took the punishment for all my sins in my place. Now, why did the lamb have to die? God is a just God. He cannot help it. That is his nature. He is just, which means he has to judge every sin. Why well, is the God of rules and order? He makes the planets and the sand or makes the electron fly on that he makes it. everything follows the rules. Man just has the choice as to whether or not he's going to follow. But he still has these rules. He's a just God, which means he has to judge every sin. Right? And there's a thing in law, silence equals consent. So if there's a sin and God doesn't judge it, he's actually giving consent to it. Remember the old wedding ceremonies? Speak now or forever hold your peace. If you're holding your peace, you are giving consent to the wedding. If God has a sin and he doesn't judge it, and he holds his, he's giving consent to it. And guess what? He's not going to give consent to sin. So his very nature pushes him to want to judge the sin. You know that's been implanted in each of us so much 
that every police drama you see on TV, right, NCIS or whatever, starts off with an injustice done in the first two minutes. Some innocent person is killed. And you are held captive the rest of the hour, wanting the person that did it to be brought to justice. I mean, that's sort of the theme of all these different movies, and, right? So in the first two minutes of the book of Genesis, an injustice is done. Cain kills Abel. And God says to Cain, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What was it crying? An injustice is done. Innocent guy killed. You're a just God. You've got to judge the guy that did it. That's the only side of God that the devil knew. Here's Lucifer, beautiful angel, puffed up with pride. He wants to put his throne higher than the throne of God? God said, you have sinned against me. You are out of here. So the devil goes into the garden, sees Adam and Eve, says, you know what? If I can get them to sin against God one time, God will have to judge them. Gets them to sin, that was easy. Stands back and says, ha, you're a just God, you got to judge him. So God sends this fireball of judgment, but in steps the lamb and takes the hit. So God is just in that he judges every sin. He's love in that he provided the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. Do you see it? You remember reading the book of Revelation a thousand times, but one thing seems clear. It is God that is pouring out the vials of judgment, breaking the seals, angels throwing censers down. And I thought, why is that? Once and for all, for the rest of eternity, God has to settle the score and judge every sin that he missed along the way. <laughs> so you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there were these sins and you never judged them. Uh, no, the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever, and the angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Nobody's going to question that God judges sin. But in that sense... Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. He took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross. That's why he's sweating drops of blood. You know what it says? A day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. He experienced that day of judgment as if it was a thousand years. You think, what is our, our judgment? Well, without him, our judgment would be eternal damnation. God just took the duration of the judgment and condensed it and increased the intensity of the judgment and he dumped it all on Jesus. If you were to think of it as a scale, an eternal being who is innocent suffering for a finite period of time is equal to all the finite beings who are guilty suffering for an eternal period of time. Wow. Let me say that again. An eternal being who is innocent suffering for a finite period of time is equal to all the finite beings who are guilty suffering for an eternal period of time. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin upon the cross. <laughs> That's why we sing praises to him. You know, it, and then he rose from the dead to prove he's true. Now, the beauty of the, God's plan is that he paid the price for our sin. As long as you're doing the Cain route, thinking that you got to do good works to get to heaven, you will always have this nagging thought in the back of your head, did I do enough? And that alone will cause you to hesitate running and pre hugging the Lord. Is he still mad at me? Did I do enough? I don't know. I didn't know. You're going to hesitate. Once you believe that Jesus paid for it all, and you really truly believe it, that he actually paid every single sin, he paid for every single debt that you had, it's all been paid for. Once you really, you, you really truly believe it, it's like... You mean there's, there's nothing left to hold me back? There's nothing I have to be ashamed of. There's no, there's no money. I, I don't owe him anything. Every, yeah, it's all been paid. It's all been paid. And you really believe it. You're like, well, shoot. And you, run, you can come and embrace the Lord. Your polarity changes and you're drawn back to him and you can worship him and adore him forever and ever. Thank you so much. God bless you.